So, but I think you guys know me, so, right, Tracy? Mm -hmm. And um, just a quick background on, um, so I started, my first patient that I sat with that died was probably about, oh my gosh, 25 years ago. So, um, and then I have been a hospice social worker. I have taught <coughs> aging and death and dying since the, since like 88, so long time. And this is very much my passion and my love. And I know that for many people, um, you think, well, why would I need end of life? I'm gonna work with children or, you know, so is this keynote really, you know, is this lecture really gonna be important? And what I would say is it's important to everyone. <coughs> And if I had my way, it would be mandatory for everyone. And the reason I say that is not just because I love it, but because since I've been at the School of Social Work, I've had to go to the Child, Youth, and Family field units many times um, because of losses that they have had, um, either their client dying or uh, maybe a parent dying and they don't know how to help the child grieve. So I hope that you'll think about this in terms of even if you don't work, with, even if you're not working with elders, death and dying that will happen, whether it's a suicide, whether it's your own family members, and so hopefully this will be useful for everyone. Okay? All right. Okay. Um, so I'm very informal. Um, Y'all can stop me at any time. And can everybody hear me okay without the mic? I have four brothers, so I have this big voice to survive. Um, so this is one of my all-time favorite quotes. I use it, I think, every time I do this because I really think this is kind of the, the key to everything. Burnell says, it's not a matter of whether you're going to live or die, nor a question of when you're going to die. It's a question of how you're going to die. And that's what I care about, is how people die. So the one statistic that's 100% is that everybody in this room is going to die. Right? We can all be guaranteed of that. Now, hopefully you live a long, long time, but we can all be guaranteed of that. So what I care about is that there are people out there that can ensure that we have that good death that everybody deserves. So today, this talk is going to be, I really want um, to talk about this from a generalist perspective. We are a generalist school. We teach generalist social work, and I think that um, so hopefully this will be a good demonstration of how to think about any topic that way. I'm going to talk about historical shifts in dying. It will not be boring. Everybody hears the word history and they're like, ah, it won't be boring. Terminology, social problem. What is the social problem? So what? Why do we care? Role of social work. And then I have cultural assessment questions at the end. Those are at the end of your um, PowerPoint for you to have. So I'm not even planning to get there, but I always want to have those in there for you. Also in, the, in your folder, you'll see that I have a resource sheet. Um, usually I bring books to pass around, but there's just too many people. So um, I put a resource sheet in there, and I also included a couple of books on dementia. Not anything to do with dying necessarily, but I think that's important too. So you have that. And then you have the evaluation sheet that you'll turn in at the end. And then there's some activities, so we'll do that. All right, so the historical shifts. This is really important. I remember my mom before she died, she said to me, she always thought that what I did was really depressing and didn't know why I chose it and sure that my, I made my students all upset. She just never got it. <laughs> but she did say to me one day before she was dying, she said, Tracy, why, why, why do you have to have a social worker for dying? I mean, you just die. What's so complicated? And, um, you know, and I told her, I said, Mom, there's a lot that's changed over the years. It's come up, there's so many ethical issues around dying. And so then we kind of talked about it a little bit. And that's what I'm going to talk about with y'all. Um, we have gone through changes. And it's important to understand the context of a social problem. If we understand that context, it helps us in terms of how we then address it. So a long time ago, like 1800s and back, Death was really traditional. Um, elders that I've worked with that were alive then, so this was when I was really young working with those elders, and you know, they were alive in the late 1800s, and they talked about, you know, people just died. It's not like there was a dying process. People got sick and they died. One elder told me about how her husband got a stomach ache, 
She laid him on the kitchen table and he died. It was probably appendicitis. But that's kind of the way it was. We didn't have medicine and stuff, so death was just a part of life. There weren't issues about it. And so really the authority figure was the priest, the rabbi, whoever it was in the community, because usually the church, these were smaller communities back then. We didn't have big cities in the U.S. And so um, it was usually the local church and whoever ran that church then, that was considered the authority figure. So if there's a death, you call that person. And so really coping, people prayed. That was the coping. Um, and living with death, and death occurred in the community. We didn't have hospitals, so that's where death occurred. Now, between traditional and modern, we did begin to have hospitals, but hospitals were death traps. If you wanted to die, the best place to go was a hospital. And the reason for that was because they did not know anything about antibiotics or, you know, there was no x-rays, there was nothing. So, you know, a doctor would be have his hands plunged in a body working, blood, take and wipe his hands off on a towel and go to the next body and plunge his hands in. Now we all get grossed at the thought of that because we know about bacteria, but they didn't. So people avoided hospitals. It's like, oh, terrible. And so doctors, people did not see them as very important or knowledgeable. But we go to the modern times, like 1930s, 1940s, and things shift. And they shift because now the x-ray machine, the microscope, all of these things start to be invented. And people realize, doctors realize, about bacteria. And so that makes a difference. And as things improve, medically, as medicine gets stronger, you move to this modern time that we were in until like the 60s. And that modern time was a time when um, really the doctor was the authority figure. And I'm seeing people nod. And if you ask your grandparents or whatever, I know my grandparents, it was like, you don't argue with the doctor. Even my parents, when my dad wanted to fire the doctor, he took me aside and whispered, and he said, you got to do it. He said, I could never fire a doctor. You know, because in their generation, you know, doctors were it. Um, and so medicine, dominant discourse. So now we're starting to die longer. We're not just dying. We're actually kind of dying longer, um, and that makes a difference. And so how did we begin to cope? By not talking about it. Because we had hope. We had doctors who actually saved people, who actually kept people alive. And so what happens is people set start, started saying, you know, we don't need to, let's not talk about death. There's no reason to talk about death, because we can beat it. We know now we can beat it if we use doctors. People started going to hospitals, and that's where people began dying. They weren't dying in the community. Death was controlled. So you had a very different environment. Now comes the place where everything changes, and this is why we have the issues we have today, which is going to lead us into what we're talking about. And that is the fact that when we had civil rights, it wasn't just about, in terms of um, discrimination, of race, there were many groups at that time that came up. Uh, one of the groups was, for example, the Grey Panthers. The Grey Panthers, led by Maggie Kuhn, and the Grey Panthers were civil rights for elders. And at that time, you also had people who said, you know what, I have a right to make decisions about my dying process. Because by the 60s, we'd gotten really good at putting death off, or even eliminating death for some people who got totally cured. But at that time, dying really began its trajectory of where it is today, which is we can live a long time dying. So people said, you know, the 60s were the time of, you know, all the self-psychology, you know, who am I, all of that. And so what people said was, doctors shouldn't be making these decisions. I should make the decision. My dying process, I should decide what I want and not someone else. Coping, Kubler-Ross, everybody, you know, people heard of Kubler-Ross? First, first person ever, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, to actually talk about dying, to actually bring it to the public, to put it out there, and to talk about it. She did that for us in the 60s. And in the 70s, we had the first hospice that, you know, from England, knew from England where it was begun. So we're seeing a shift now. And all of a sudden, the authority is ourselves, and 
psychology, talking about it, expressing it, and the context is the family. So it's the family in terms of you may die in the hospital, you may die at home, but it's the family. So this is where you get into the ethical issues because now we, can, we think we can beat death or we can at least control it. And that leads to ethical issues. You've got all these machines, you've got all of these decisions that are to be made, and that's why it comes to what I told mom, which is kind of a complicated mess at times. And I see people in the audience who work in end of life, and they know what I mean. So that's the history, okay? Really important to understand so that you understand how we got here. And then what I want to cover is some terminology. Um, because I want everybody to be on the same page, but you know what? This terminology would not have been, if you had looked at terminology in those three historical errors, would have been very different. Terminology in any field is a reflection of where we are. It helps us to understand what's going on. And so we're going to go through these today. Okay, somebody can have a terminal illness, okay, um, and it's going to result in death, but it could result in death 9, 12, 15 years. Examples would be like Parkinson's, like Michael J. Fox has. You know, it is terminal, eventually. Um, but he's not dying, per se. So he has a terminal illness. Um, dementia is another terminal illness. Cancer can be a terminal illness. So it just means that it, that's an illness that will result in death. It's important to distinguish that from somebody who's terminally ill, though. Somebody who's terminally ill has six months or less to live. And you can imagine the differences of somebody who has maybe nine years with the disease versus someone that's just been told you have this much longer to live. And that's why it's important to distinguish because what they need and what we do for them as social workers, um, it differs. And so you'll know individuals can have a terminal illness but not be defined as terminally ill. So, and I'll be talking a lot about I'll be talking about terminally ill today, six months or less. Advanced directive. So back in the 60s when everything was changing was a time when there were some major cases um, that went to court and the result was advanced directives. Now people talk about a living will. What's really important here is advanced directive is the umbrella term. Okay, so when you fill out an advanced directive, you're doing two things. You're doing your living will and you're doing your durable power of attorney for health care. You need both, okay? Particularly, the most important is the second one. So when you, if you were to download from the Wisconsin site the an advanced directive, you're going to get both. You're going to get the living will and the durable power of attorney. The living will basically lays out what it is that you would want if you could no longer speak for yourself. So if you were to be in a coma, whatever, you could check off, um, if I'm in a coma, whatever, you know, I want, I want feeding tubes, I want life-saving equipment, or I don't, or I, you know, sign a DNR order, that is, do not resuscitate. So it lets people know what you would want. But what's important about the durable power of attorney for health care is that's the person who's going to make sure that what you checked off, people the doctor holds to and everybody else holds to. So when my mom was dying, my brother and I became, you can have more than one, and my brother and I became her durable power of attorney and so for health care. And so we were the ones that made sure that the doctors and everyone followed my mother's wishes. If she had not signed this and only had the living will, you know, we definitely, I think they would have followed them, but it's much less certain. And let me say what's important and so this is also something that I want you to think about. I'm going to talk about cultures and communities throughout because we have to think about that because we have to remember that I can say what I just said and move on. But if I do that, then I'm not fair to all communities. For example, I'll give you two examples. One is if you are uh, in a partnership, same sex, opposite sex, whatever, you are not married, this is not legal. It's not a legal document unless you go and you get a lawyer. You have to have a lawyer. If you're in a marriage that's a legal marriage, state where it's legal, then you can have two witnesses that can be your neighbors, anybody who's not listed in your will, who won't benefit from your death, they sign it and it's a legal document. You don't need a lawyer. 
So that's an important thing to know. It's an important thing to know when you work with clients and they're asking you because people will say, oh, oh, it's fine, it's a legal document. Uh-uh. I've seen too many times where, particularly same-sex partners, the partner, the surviving partner has lost everything and not had a voice in terms of health care. The other thing about advanced directives, um, for example, um, with um, some tribes and, um, and you see this some, in some other cultures too, um, one of the terms, the terms they, so my father was Potawatomi and the term that was used um, by the Potawatomis is wakunza. And that is if you speak it, it becomes true. So am I gonna fill out an advanced directive and talk about my death and comas? No, because I just gave life to it. The Navajo believe this, it's called the beauty way. And so with Navajo, it took a long time to figure out how to have Navajo sign advanced directives. Now, why do we care whether they sign them or not? Because of the clinics on the reservations, they still have to go by federal law. And you have to have so many people that have a completed, so many people in your clinic that have a completed advanced directive. So what they did was they put the advanced directive in third person, and that's how that worked with traditional Navajo. So very important all along the way as we go today to think about um, that um, as we look at this, we're looking through our lens, and each of our lenses are different, but they're not necessarily the lens of our client. Do not resuscitate, basically just what it says. You know, you're not gonna do CPR if a patient stops breathing um, or the heart stops beating. Um, and that's important to know if people have a DNR order. And if someone does have a DNR order or advanced directive, they should have multiple copies. All their doctors should have them, even their dentist, because sometimes people die at the dentist because um, of anesthesia. I know everybody's like looking at me. <laughs> but they do. So um, everybody should have a copy. Um, and CPR. Seems like people would think, well, no matter what, you'd want to do CPR, but not if there's not a quality of life, if somebody feels like there's not a quality of life. And honestly, CPR for, for example, for older people, it is very painful. It breaks the bones because of frailty. So CPR, you know, it's something to really think about. Here's a really good, another good example of terminology um, that has come since the 60s because of um, all the ethical issues, and that is terminal or palliative sedation. Terminal or palliative sedation is also called double effect. Um, and here, the reason you would do this is that somebody is in so much pain, so someone is dying and they're in so much pain that the doctors cannot get rid of the pain, cannot control it without sedating them. And that's a big thing because when you sedate somebody, that means the family can't communicate with them. And that person can't. And maybe that person has unfinished business they want to do, and now there's, they're going to be sedated. So there are people who will choose to be in the pain and not take the sedation or be as sedated as they can be to the point of as long as they're clear, or they can choose what's called terminal or palliative sedation. The intent here um, is that it's to induce this deep sleep to take care of that pain. And different play usually so it's handled different ways but most hospitals and hospices um, have uh, will have pulled together uh, a team and they will you know doctor social worker nurse etc and the family members and the patient if the patient is doesn't have any dementia and can be involved and make decisions and then they will talk about what this means to make sure that this is what the patient wants the good news is we now have intermittent palliative sedation, which means that used to be when you did terminal or palliative sedation, that was it. You were sedated and you were not brought back. You weren't brought out of the sedation, so then you would die. So truly, if you had things you need to say, things to talk about, you needed that done long before um, you were sedated. But now they have intermittent where they can do an agreement about bringing you out of this, out of the sedation after a week or after two weeks, um, so that you can say, you know what, I, I, I want to spend time with my family. I know I'm in pain, but and then they can put you back in. So there is a little bit of flexibility there. The thing about this is, and the reason it's often referred to as double effect, is that it can be that when you are sedated, 
uh, you can die. So for some people with the sedation, that can result in death. So there's that double effect. One is the trying to control the pain. The other is um, that there could be death. But remember, this is legal in every state. The intent is not to end the person's life. That said, terminal sedation happens across the country with the intent of someone's life being ended. It's done quietly, that's illegal to do that when the intent is to end someone's life, then you've stepped over and it's illegal. But that is done. So it's a little more controversial. Um, Life-sustaining treatment, kind of mentioned it. So resuscitation, uh, mechanical ventilation, you know, when you go on the machines, artificial nutrition and hydration, dialysis, anything you're hooked up to, a machine or you have a, you know, anything feeding to whatever, anything that's being given to you that's going to keep you alive. And that's, that's the thought behind it. Withholding and withdrawing treatment, much easier to never have started treatment than to have to withdraw it. And um, I can think of um, family members, I know one family member, I think I, I must have visited that family for every day for like two weeks because their mother had dementia, she had a feeding tube, um, and she kept pulling it out. And it was in her mouth, and every time she pulled it out, you know, it was painful, they would put it back in, because that's what she had put down in her advance directive, that she wanted one. But the family knew at this point that they needed to make a decision. Um, and so it's really hard, those types of decisions are very painful for a family. Sometimes things are started because there's not an advanced directive and it's unknown what people want and so these treatments will be started. Really hard to stop them. So um, this is the reason for advanced directives, to be really clear and for people to know what it is you want. I talk with my son all the time about what I want. He tells me I, I need to get a life. <laughs> ha ha. Okay, two more terms that have come up um, because of all this ethical, um, ethical issues, and that is physician-assisted euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide. Yes? Well, okay, so he, a very good question. I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. Why is it um, difficult to withdraw treatment? He wanted to know, is that legal? Is it the legal issues? So it can be. It can be many things. If there's not an advanced directive, then it can end up being a fight with a family. I might take, say, we're brother and sister, and you say, I know mom never wanted it, and I say, I, I, I know mom did, and then I take you to court and we battle it. So that can be a big problem. So it, you know, if you think about Terry Schiavo in that case in Florida, that was a huge. Um, but it also can be hard because of the family. So let's say that even if there is an advanced directive, and, but it was located late and the feeding tube had gone in or the person had gone on a machine, then the difficulty lies with a family who's gotta, who's gotta then turn off that machine or pull that tube. So it's both, thank you. And y'all don't hesitate to ask questions, okay? Good, thank you. So physician-assisted death is like an umbrella term um, and it covers these two. <laughs> Physician-assisted physician euthanasia, um, that I think if I lived to be, if I lived another 50 years, I don't think that's gonna be legal in the US. Um, this one, it's legal in um, uh, like the Netherlands and Belgium, it's legal in some countries, but this is the controversial one. And the reason is because the physician gives the lethal injection to the patient. So whereas, down here with physician assisted suicide, which is legal in Oregon, it's legal in Washington, and it's legal right now in Montana in that the judge has said it's legal, but there's a battle going on in Montana right now. Um, and here, the physician writes the prescription for the patient who then fills it, who then ingests it. So, you can, so why do you think? Euthanasia would be controversial, more controversial than a physician-assisted suicide. Because people can change their minds with physician-assisted suicide. Right, they can change their minds with physician-assisted suicide. 
Exactly. Anybody else? Yep. Because physicians, the code of ethics is do no harm. Do no harm, which is an issue for, you're right, that's an issue, huge. So it's hard enough to write it, but at least you're not giving it. If somebody is both unable to speak for themselves or nobody else is in the room, how would you know that they wouldn't just, just do it even if they didn't want to? Exactly. So how would you know some of the biggest um, battles against euthanasia are by people with disabilities? Um, because they fear that, and elders fear that, well, what if people just gave, what if doctors just gave injections and decided, you know what, let's make decisions about who, you know, who's costing us a lot of money to live or who contributes or doesn't contribute. Um, and so that's, that's a big issue. So those three things are the number one things. So physician-assisted suicide, there's bills in almost every state. Vermont, Massachusetts, there are bills in almost every state. Uh, Wisconsin, it's come and gone a number of times. So this one, I think we will see more states. And I'll talk, um, you'll, you'll learn more about why someone want that in just a little bit. Okay, palliative care. This is the last one and then we're gonna move on. Um, palliative care, so, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was just curious, do you know that Yes, yeah, so if you want to look at stats, for, it's called the slippery slope. Um, and what that is, is where it's, it's, it's just like what you said. It's really, um, it's apparent or there's evidence that this person did not ask for it, but it was given to them. And so if you go to the Netherlands, um, if you just type in Netherlands and physician assisted euthanasia, you'll see the percentages are small. But that's because it's really hard to know, right? But definitely the Netherlands. They've been, they've been doing research for years. Is the, uh, the, uh, can the physician refuse to do it? Yes. So can the, the physician can definitely, let me go back for just a minute. Um, the physician can definitely, like with physician-assisted euthanasia, in countries where that's legal, the physician can definitely say, I don't want to do it. Physician-assisted suicide, physician can say, I don't want to do it. I will say in terms of social workers, and this is something for you all to know, although we don't live in a state where it's legal, were you to go and practice in Oregon, it is legal for you to be present when someone takes those pills, but because it's legal in that state, this is NASW, NASW, National Association of Social Workers says, if it is legal in the state, you may be present to be with your client if your client <coughs> wants you there. You cannot, however, in any way participate so you can't give the pills, you can't give the glass of water, you can't grind anything up, you can simply be there. And this is a big battle in Oregon. Um, there's more coming out, there's Oregon's, this has been now since 1994, so there's, there's more data in terms of Oregon. Um, although they didn't really get to practice until 1998 because there were battles. So really the stats start in 1998, but um, uh, the social workers really struggle with this. They struggle with not feeling, so for some social workers, not everybody, I think there's a big split on this, whether they feel like it's ethical or not, but it, what stro social workers struggle is if they think it's unethical, but their client wants them there. Um, hospice struggles with this. Hospices have different rules about this, and I'll be talking about that in a minute. So you have to be a resident of the state. Okay. Yeah, you have to be a resident. And if you go on the Oregon website, Death with Dignity website, this is a long process. It's not, you don't just walk in and ask for the prescription. You gotta do it many times and you have to do it verbally and in written format. So they really, and you have to go see a psychiatrist if they think you're depressed. And yeah, they don't wanna become the death state. I'm assuming some of those things go into like mental competence. But do you know kind of how they would determine when you go to the doctor to do the request, if the doctor has any concerns, he sends you, he, by law, he has to send you to, for an assessment if it's cognitive or a psychiatrist for depression. They're very careful about that. <coughs> they really have written this, and Washington took exactly what Oregon was doing, because Oregon's not had any really problems because they really have so many steps. Some people die before they ever get to the last steps. Yes, you can, you, once you get that prescription, you can fill it at any time and take it. No, they're not giving it for dementia because the person who gets it has to be cognitively intact 
um, at the time that they get it. And if there was a diagnosis of dementia, um, now I haven't read anything about that. The big thing they talk about is ALS in terms of somebody knowing that they have, that they have dementia, um, that they have a chance. So, so uh, just to repeat, and then I'm gonna go on because we could be on physician assisted suicide and stuff all day. Um, but um, he said that in working with the elderly, he really sees that, the, that their fear is that they will not be able to get um, an injection if dying gets, it becomes bad. And, and that is true in when they're toward, what we see is when elderly are well, we don't see that. The polls show that they're against this. But when they begin to get ill, um, then we see them change and want it. Um, so, the, you know, it's never one or the other like 100%, but those are what the research shows the tendencies tend to be. All right, so palliative care. Palliative care is comfort care. This is the World Health Organization's definition. It's important to know about palliative care. Used to be if I said palliative care, I was talking about people who were dying. But people who, who had chronic illness said, why is it that I have to be dying in order to get palliative care? So now palliative care can start when someone has a chronic illness. What's different about palliative care than what we would just say is medical care is the holistic nature. As you can see here, it talks about chronic and life-limiting illness, which is a nice way to say terminal. Um, and it's accomplished through, and this is the key thing, pain, other physical, psychosocial, and spiritual. So here what you're talking about is that instead of focusing on the medical, that people and, and insurance companies will then cover palliative care and cover the physiological, the emotional, the social, and the cultural and the spiritual. They will cover it. And so that makes a difference in terms of us being able to provide it to people. And so, um, and for many cultures, this always made sense because that was the way help was seen, is that of course all these dimensions were critical. Um, but in our world, um, for a long time, it was really a medical focus. And I'm gonna talk in a minute about the controversy because this is gonna get into the social problem that we're gonna deal with. So when you said insurance companies covered it, all of them, or is it more? If they cover palliative care, Medicare covers it, they all cover it, yeah. Palliative care is kind of this, um, it's very uh, popular and widespread right now. So like this between somebody with like MS? Mm-hmm, ALS, anybody that has chronic illness, um, it's felt like because the chronic illness, you know, if you think about having to deal with, uh, I have a friend whose arthritis is spreading in her spine. Now, she could go about and talk and do everything, but she's in a lot of pain. She would be eligible for this. Does there have to be a certain threshold? Like, okay, now you're really in pain, now you're eligible for that. Or is no. that any time? Any if you have a chronic or life-limiting illness. Good question. Good. Anything else? Okay. So, what's the social problem? Okay. The social problem is, in the United States, this is really important, terminal individuals cannot count on a quality dying process. They cannot. There's uneven access to palliative care. Supposedly it's everywhere. Supposedly everyone has access to it. Um, there's an uneven provision of it. How it's provided, even if it's being provided, how it's gonna be provided to one person versus another. And there's an uneven provision of palliative care as defined by the World Health Organization. Because what we're seeing is a backslide from palliative care being psychosocial, spiritual, and physiological. We're seeing a backslide to medical. And uh, social work and the spiritual being left out. Who are the players? When we are looking as social workers at a social problem, we have got to understand who the players are because that's really going to help us as we go forward to work with a client and their family. Um, the societal culture. Y'all saw when I was talking about the history, how the societal culture impacted. 
So we have a societal culture. We have many cultures within that societal culture, but there is a dominant societal culture. The government, what their <coughs> rules and laws are, we just talked about organs laws and um, we talked about advanced directives and how they're legal or not legal, insurance, whether something's covered or not, and do you even have insurance? Um, healthcare <coughs> professional organizations, um, there are some organizations that um, uh, are moving palliative care, what we social workers would say backwards because they're moving it back to the medical, they're medical organizations, um, so they can have an impact. Healthcare professionals, down to the patient and the family because then this is where the impact is felt, right? Also, the other thing we have to think about are the key factors. It makes a difference what class, and we're gonna talk about this. It makes a difference about our age, how we're treated. It makes a difference about our race and ethnicity, our sexual orientation, our gender, whether we live in a rural or urban area, and many other things. But those are important things to think about because that's where we start seeing the unevenness. <coughs> so, just some statistics. So if you look at this, you can see over two million deaths, one million in hospice, and then look at the breakdown. Now this is how they break it down. I never liked these categories of Asian and American Indian and black because it's like that encompasses many different cultures but this is how the uh, National Hospice Organization has it and what do you see there what have we seen for the last two years more yes more white and I can also tell you those are more white middle class so definitely hospice care is not being evenly received by people the access to it and there's a a lot of reasons for that. We'll get to that. Okay, physical suffering. This study was one of the biggest studies that was ever done. It was done in 1997, so you may think, why didn't she bring something a little more current? Because there's been no change. And this was huge. It was five major, major hospitals on the <coughs> East Coast. And look at, I just gave you some stats. Um, through 3,300 severe pain. 40%. Physical symptoms difficult to bear, 73%. And the severe pain, 40% of those patients were over 80. Another study done, 50% of whom reported moderate or severe pain. I could go on and on all the way up to right this moment. We don't see those statistics change much. And what is really important is, look at this. So the access to pain medication, African-American nursing home patient residents, this was one study done by the Institute of Medicine, with cancer, 63% less likely to receive pain medication than white residents. Pharmacies in poor communities, significantly higher odds of medications being out of date, so not as effective, and limited stock. And there are places where there are absolutely no pain medications. Under-medicating problematic for minorities, women, and patients 70 and over. This statistic does not change. I can look at research, and I can look at research, and I can look at research, and it stays the same. And that is huge when you think about it, because does everybody have access to the same death? Uh-uh. Mike? Yeah, I just have a quick question. Uh, isn't it true that the older that you get, um, your pain or uh, your medication tolerance, you don't have to take as much due to that? So would that attribute to this? No. You know, to the under is that? No, because, um, so it depends. So it is true that as we get older, uh, the, our endings in terms of touch, because our blood doesn't go all the way to the end, we don't feel as much. But I tell you what, people feel pain. There are still people have high thresholds, low thresholds. It's kind of the same to the end. And when they do these statistics, they are asking people about how they report their pain. So this is how they're reporting it. So they're saying, my pain is severe. I was just, I was just referring to the medication, that the doses don't aren't as, uh, as effective. They're more sensitive to the medication. No, nope. that, that's, that's not it. Okay. Mm -hmm. But that is a good point. And medication is, I mean, I could do a whole day lecture on medication. 
because it is very different for people as they age, et cetera. But in these cases, all that's controlled for. No, good point. Yes? Medicaid and Medicare cover hospice? Medicare is a, is a hospice benefit. Medicare covers hospice. Um, it covers all your medication that is related to your hospice diagnosis. Um, it covers the nurse, you know, all the services in your home, or if you have a facility like here we have a Grace. But it does not, if you do go into a facility like a Grace, it doesn't cover your room and board, but then Medicaid usually will kick in if you're poor enough. Right. So you would think then that sounds like, well, that's not stopping. That's, that's and no, that's not one of the reasons why we don't, we see the unevenness. And there are places, I work with a, a researcher, um, talk to him every now and then, and he works um, the poorest reservation in the United States, Pine Ridge. And they are so far out. That's the other thing to think about is that, um, you know, if you're so far out, um, he said they drive up and they'll bring pain medications in, and he said people are screaming and they can hear them without even getting out of the car. And there is no place close by. There is no pharmacy. So we also have to think about, you know, it, when you're in cities, though, there are places in Milwaukee where you're not going to get good pain meds. You're not. Um, but for the most part, the rule is really an issue, a real issue for people. <coughs> so that makes that very important. So already we see that there is a difference. So we talk about palliative care. We talk about it being available, but not to everybody. So now, and then I promise in 10 minutes, I'll give you a break. Um, so what do you feel about the psychosocial or the spiritual or emotional? And don't look ahead on the PowerPoint. I meant to leave that off. There's no cheating. I want everybody to look up at me and come up with green ideas. No pressure now. So what do you think are some of those things? So in terms of a, psycho, so a psychosocial issue in the dying process might be that someone, even if they had the option, to choose physician-assisted suicide would be uncomfortable doing so because for them spiritually it goes against their beliefs. Yeah. What else for a person who's dying? What would be their issues they would confront? They might be really afraid of family forgetting them. Right. Is the family going to forget me? <coughs> it, what about my legacy? Did I do anything that's worth remembering for people? Over here? I think in terms of family, emotional, and really that your family's not going to respect your wishes about Exactly. Are people going to respect your wishes? So if you have wishes and maybe you have not gotten them, you know, they're not written down or maybe they are written down and they're for like after, like you said, the funeral want to be cremated or whatever, will people respect those? Um, the impact that the individual has on the people around them, their family and their friends and the stress that they cause them with their illness. Right. And that's back and forth, right? So there's the stress of the family members um, being stressed by the person who's dying and um, by the potential mm -hmm. loss and also by trying to provide all the care and then there's the person who's dying who doesn't want, who feels they are causing stress and they are a burden. So definitely the emotional is there. I'm sure there's a lot of ethical norms as well, um, especially with the living probably doing somebody who's dying as And that's a really good point. There, there's a film, um, the Angola prison film, um, The Hospice, um, and that's a really good film to watch. It's on YouTube, and um, I think it's called Hospice, Angola Hospice, Opening the Door, um, and that is what that's about. If somebody murdered somebody, why do we care if they have a good death? Yeah. I'm going to go back here. Oh, and I'm not supposed to walk past here. Yes? <laughs> Oh, hey then. Oh yeah. And then I'm gonna um, go. Well, I think well sometimes the uh, you know person who is dying is worried about their family members. Exactly. What is it going to be like for them after they pass? They know they're going to be so unhappy and sad. Exactly. Religious existentialism. 
Yes, existentialism, exactly. And that, it goes beyond the organized religion in, in bright, whether you attend church or not. It's more about, uh, about how um, you, you've been in this world, how you fit in this world, how, you know, what meaning has, 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 have you given to this life and, and then to the next. Okay, a couple more. Um, the choice of um, who will take care of them at end of life, who will be their caretaker, will it be their family members, or will they choose institutional care? Right, and then having to decide where you're going to die and who's going to take care of you. Exactly, and that's a big one. You got your trauma, your experiences in your life definitely play a role at the end of life. Definitely, yeah. And for veterans, that has wholly di very different meanings. Okay, two more? Now that is a really good point when the culture and the religion. So um, those of you in the back, um, she so was saying she's Buddhist, and being Buddhist, you would have this calm, peaceful, accepting death, except for her culture and the family to be, to save face, to have, to be a good son or a good daughter, you must fight to make sure that your parent remains alive. And so she was saying that can be at odds for the person who's trying to do the dying peacefully, but, you know, people are pulling. Good, good job. So I want to say that, so you, you just heard, and, and there are many more, and I'm going to bring some of those up in a minute, lots and lots of psychosocial issues. My research, the research of others, all show that when you talk to people who are dying, they don't talk about the pain. They don't talk about the physical. They talk about the psychosocial and the spiritual. I've had people on a scale of zero, no pain, 10, the worst pain imaginable, be a nine, a eight, a seven, and they want to talk about the psychosocial. And they don't want any pain meds because they want to be clear enough to be able to deal with the psychosocial. So the psychosocial is important. Medicare, hospice benefit, um, most people who die are elders, 85% over the age of 65. Um, and so of the deaths, 85% of deaths are <coughs> over the age of 65. But Medicare, this is how it's defined as a social worker has an MSW, a BSW, or a baccalaureate degree in psychology, sociology, or other fields related to social work and supervised by an MSW. And social workers are the only members of hospice and interdisciplinary group required to be under the direction of a physician. And that is Medicare law. And what that basically says is, ah, somebody with a BA in sociology can take care of the psychosocial of the person who's dying. You know, they just need to be supervised by an MSW who may or may not be on site, who may come, you know, once a month or whatever. So, again, you see where regulations, here we're saying there are all of these issues, but this is a regulation that impacts us. I've been to Washington a couple of times on this. We met with people from Medicare and we said, really? Would you say um, has an MD or other field related to medical? No. So why would we say that for social work? Okay, so I'm gonna give you some examples. Later I'm gonna talk about strategies for, and I'm gonna give you some um, interventions that I've used, but for right now, just to finish up this section, these are some, these are the most common things that research shows, um, and also if you talk to people who work in end of life, when people are dying, they fear future suffering. Um, you, they, you can explain, they will ask you over and over again, so, so what's it gonna be like? What's my dying gonna be like? Um, they fear death. Do you have, you know, I've had people say, well, what did people's eyes look like when they were dying? Can you give me some idea of what that might be like? Um, lack of sense of control. Um, sense of control is the number one reason for physician-assisted um, suicide in Oregon and Washington needing that sense of control. Now that's not true of all cultures. Um, when I did a study, um, I had people who were from China in the study and they did not, the sense of control wasn't even an issue because they talked about the collective and that really it's the collective. Um, but for other people, it was very much this individual sense of control. Um, lack of enjoyment in life, just not enjoying your life anymore. Yeah, you're dying and you're alive, but it, you're not having fun. Um, unfinished business, things that you really need to get done um, before you die, whether it's to 
you know, maybe there's a son or a daughter you're estranged from and you want that relationship to, to be a good one or um, just things that you've promised to do. Maybe I've had family members talk about things that they wish they had written up, you know, history for their family. So unfinished business, lack of dignity. Every one of these we can do something about, and I'm going to talk about every single one of these we can address as social workers. Feeling dependent or a burden. And then in terms of the social, lack of social support. Not everybody has social support. Not everybody has someone to be there for them. Um, I remember a woman that I did, had in a grief group, and I had her do, uh, we talked about our social support and, and drawing our social support system. In her system, there was nobody on her system. And so each person could talk about it if they wanted to, and she said, well, there's nobody in my system. She said, all of my family died in the Holocaust, and I'm the only person left. And she said, once you lose everybody, she said, no way are you letting anybody get close to you again. So she had nobody. Um, conflictual social support. I remember a woman um, that I was interviewing for my study, and she, um, I'd asked her about support, and she said, well, my son. Um, I live with my son, and I, my face must have showed like kind of a, oh, you know, that's nice, or, you know, it must have had an expression. She said, yeah. People, people always have that expression. But she said, let me tell you. Every morning I wake up, and when I wake up, he comes in and he stands over my bed and he looks down and he said, she said, if my eyes are open, if I'm awake, he will go, he will say, and this is a quote, oh crap, you're still alive. She said, it's a duty to him, that's it. He didn't want to put up with anybody saying he didn't do his duty. So social support, we, when I first started in social work years ago, it was believed that if you had somebody, you had, social, you had support. Social workers know that's not true. It's the quality, not the quantity. And then feeling invisible, um, people will talk about the fact that, you know, they, it, their friends kind of disappear, people are uncomfortable, they don't know what to say, so they just kind of aren't there. I had a woman who went to her Tuesday breakfast after she got done with radiation and chemo and that basically didn't work, um, and she was given um, less than a few months to live, and, she said, we had, this was a small town, we'd done this all of our lives, all of our lives we had met as a group. She got there, the group was there, and she said everybody was uncomfortable and they were looking down and people started saying things like, you know what, I, I have to go into work early, I'm sorry, I gotta leave. She said pretty soon there was her and one other person left. And she said that's the way it's kind of been, people avoid me, feeling invisible. And then Sun now has this term called social death. And this, I think, is another thing that social workers can deal with. And um, and that is the fact that you're dead even when you're alive. Because what happens is, you, maybe you're in the bed or maybe you're sitting on the couch and the family, the son, I'm talking to the daughter, let's say, you and I are talking and we're talking about my mom and my mom's right there, she's totally okay, she can talk and everything, but you and I are just talking about her and her treatment and stuff and she's over here going, hello, I'm still alive, the social dad. You know, and we, you know, as, as social workers, I will work with family members on the importance of talking directly to the person. Three of us talk. If she has dementia or if she's in a coma, the three of us talk. You don't have social death even when someone's in a coma. We all talk together. The person may not talk. But we are saying, so mom, you know, I don't know. I mean, Tracy says we should blah, blah, blah. And even though you're not going to respond, you're still talking because what we know is that people hear. People can still hear. So social death is crucial. Um, spiritual suffering. Life lacks meaning. If life doesn't have meaning, now let me tell you, that's another one. Um, all of these are reasons people choose um, physician-assisted suicide, feeling useless. You know, if your life has no meaning, if you feel like you contribute nothing, and if you feel like everybody's having to give to you, that is hard for people. And people's individual beliefs, sometimes, like you talked about, that even if you are certain in your beliefs, other people can impact your beliefs. Or maybe all of a sudden you're not so certain anymore. And you're scared because you think, so I didn't believe in God, but what if? So there could be a lot of the spiritual. And then honoring what is sacred. Um, and being able to do that 
Um, and that often is not possible. If sage needs to be burned when the person is dying, if there needs to be chant, if there needs to be um, wailing, y y do you do that in a hospital? You can't burn things because oxygen, right? There's all these things. So honoring what is sacred can be very hard. Okay, I'm gonna do the so what, and then I'm gonna stop because then we're gonna move into the part where we're gonna talk about strategies, et cetera. So why do we care? You ask that question to social workers and they say, what do you mean why do we care? We care because people are human. But you know what, you, you can't always go there. When you work at leg with legislatures or you know anybody, you, you gotta talk a little money or you gotta give good reasons why. Well, one of the reasons we need to be caring is because of me, baby boomers. We are the silver tsunami, we really are. And we are a bossy group and we want what we want when we want it. <laughs> we can be so difficult. But we are big in numbers. And I want you to realize, this is serious, look at this. So we, we really do kind of divide the baby boomers. There's a middle where we divide them. I'm an older baby boomer, but there are younger baby boomers like my baby brother doesn't remember Vietnam or anything. So I'm lumping them for this talk. 76 million boomers, every 7.5 seconds, one turns 50. Every hour, 330 turns 60. We're sitting here for two hours and we're gonna have 660 more of those people over the age of 60 that are gonna need help. More than 10,000 will turn 65 every day for the next 19 years. And by 2050, 6.9 million more women, because we always outlive men from conception on. Um, this, is a, this is huge, and I just told you, death, 85% of deaths occur after 65. We need to care about the dying process. In addition, we need to care, and here I'm gonna use Wisconsin statistics. We need to care because we know that care is uneven in this country, particularly uneven for persons of color, um, very much so. So let's just look at Wisconsin, which is really a majority state, but if you look at it, 35% of the U.S. in 2010, this is census data, um, minority population in Wisconsin, 16.7, but look at the growth. You've got 39% growth in the, for those 10 years for the census from 2000 to 2010, 74.2% growth in the Latino population, 16.9 in the black population, 15.5 in the Native American, 45.5 in Asian. I pulled Hmong out just because I just hate showing all these groups. So there you can see Hmong, 46%. And look at the growth in Wisconsin of Caucasian, 1.2%. So our growth is in our minority populations, and yet we know <coughs> minority populations don't receive equal access. So with that, I wanna say, so that sets up the issue. It sets up the context, the terminology, the, what that social problem is, and why the heck we should care. So when we come back, we're gonna talk about, so as social workers, what the heck do we do? And so I'll talk, I'll get stories and strategies, et cetera. So.